Hello, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Teresa Greco. On the Happy Hour, you're going to have a very different experience than your traditional Happy Hour that you might have at a bar or restaurant. We're not going to be talking about cocktails and the external ways we've been conditioned to look for happiness. Is this show still going to be fun and about finding joy? Absolutely. The happy hour is where you will learn about the principles and practices that lead to true inner happiness, which is unwavering and in abundance and is not dependent on you buying, earning, achieving, searching, or doing anything to be happy. A huge weight can be lifted off of your shoulders when you know there is a place within you that is always happy. You just need to make time to connect with it. On the show, I hope to inspire and motivate you to discover a part of yourself where your genius, inner magic, and superpowers reside. Together with my guests, we will explore the latest physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being practices, and together, we'll advise you on the actionable steps you can take towards a happier, more fulfilled, authentic life. So I ask you, are some of your relationships less than perfect? I'm here to show you how you can improve your home and work relationships. Are you finding that you're not achieving your goals because of limiting beliefs about yourself that are having you playing it small instead of living your big self? Do you find yourself living on autopilot and just going through the motions? I'm going to help you to be more present and grateful for your life and to show up every day as the best version of yourself so that you can live the extraordinary life you were meant to live. Let me tell you a little bit about me, your host. I'm a certified happiness life coach, a three-time best-selling author, and the editor and senior writer of a Canadian magazine from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I'm a Reiki master, public speaker, educator of over 20 years, and educational technologies consultant. I am also the founder of a personal development company that mentors others about achieving their own personal happiness and fulfillment. So after feeling like I had lost myself in the living of my life, with commitment and self-love, I was able to reclaim my life and arrive at true inner happiness. And now I feel so strongly that what I have learned and how I was able to heal is now my life's mission to share and help others to do the same. Now, you might be thinking, what did she mean by having lost herself in the living of her life? Well, let me explain. Approaching 40 years old was my turning point in my life. Some people might call it a midlife crisis, but for me, it was an opportunity to start asking some very important questions about my life. Perhaps questions even you've wondered about yourself. I began asking questions like, is this all there is to life? Where is my life going? Am I happy living the life I'm living? Can I imagine living the same life for the next 40 years? And most importantly, there was this question, am I living my life's true purpose and full potential? I always felt as though something was missing, that there was a void inside of me that I could just never fill. What confused me was on the outside, you could say my life looked pretty perfect. I had achieved all the things that society, culture, family, religion tell you you need to have a happy life, a fulfilling career, Two healthy kids, our own home, two cars in the driveway, vacation a year, lots of beautiful material things. So if my life checked off all the boxes, why is it that I still felt unfulfilled and unhappy with my life? There was this feeling that I always needed to be more and do more and that maybe then I feel fulfilled. 
I now know that I was running on what's known as the satisfaction treadmill, which is when we continuously shift our goals upward once we've reached them. And we keep running in order to feel satisfied again. But despite the more certificates, degrees, and job experience I got, I still felt that I wasn't enough and needed to be more than who I was. For for fear of shame, guilt, judgment, and rejection, I kept my feelings to myself. I suffered in silence for a very long time, feeling like no one would understand why I felt unhappy. The questions I asked were the catalyst to me realizing that I had lost myself in the living of my life. That in trying to please everybody else by being the perfect mom, wife, daughter, daughter daughter-in-law, sister, sister sister-in-law, employee, friend, I wasn't honoring, respecting, and most of all, loving myself. I had allowed society, culture, religion, and my family and friends to tell me who to be and who I was. And because of that, I was always looking outside myself for happiness. I believe we are conditioned to think happiness is found external to us. Through the various principles and practices that I'm going to share with you each week, I was able to realize that true happiness resides inside yourself and not in your possessions, positions, titles, degrees, relationships, and experiences. There was no more, I'll be happy when I get that job or that new purse, or go on that vacation, get that promotion at work. Happiness is no longer a goal or a destination. You can choose to connect with the happiness within you in every present moment, even when your external circumstances may not necessarily be the way you want them to be. Especially during a time like this, People more than ever are searching up happiness on Google. People want to know how and where they can find it. And I am here to tell you that you can search outwardly all you want, but you are never going to find true unwavering happiness outside yourself because it doesn't exist because it doesn't exist outside you, but inside you instead. That is where it is. And I'm going to show you how to unite all aspects of yourself, your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual self to tap into that happiness. Because you're more than just your physical self making your way through the world. Your essential nature is love, peace, and happiness. But the world leads us away from who we are and causes us to feel fear, worry, doubt, frustration, anger, and all the negative feelings that we feel day to day. So it is so important that we become familiar with the very simple principles and practices that can remove the blocks that are preventing us from feeling the love, peace, and happiness that is always there at our core. So I hope you'll join me here on Hopeful Radio as we talk about the ways that we can nurture and connect with all aspects of ourselves to keep us grounded, centered, at peace, and happy. So let's get into it. I am thrilled to introduce you to my first guest on today's show. He's an Ivy League educated positive psychology expert, celebrity happiness coach, inspirational speaker, and published author. Robert Mack, hello and welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for being my first guest on the happy hour. Congratulations on the show. This is exciting. Thank you. Thank you. And I would, I wouldn't have had anybody else other than this incredible happiness expert who sees happiness in exactly the same way. And so today on the show, we're going to talk about his two best selling books. The first one is happiness from the inside out, as well as your latest one entitled love from the inside out. 
So Robert, if you could maybe start off by telling us a little bit about happiness from the inside out. Yes. So I wrote that quite a while ago. Um, it was first and foremost based on my personal life experience. I was an extraordinarily depressed kid, stressed out, anxious, self-loathing, very self-judgmental. And I always thought I would grow out of it. You know, you think that you'll accomplish your dreams. I wanted to be a professional basketball player. My idol was Michael Jordan. And I wanted to, you know, play basketball professionally, get paid for it. And I thought, well, over time, I'll work hard enough at that and I'll accomplish that and then I'll be happy, you know? And so that didn't happen exactly the way I had imagined. And despite doing well in school, do, doing well, you know, on the athletic fields, like lots of sports, I eventually had a few friends. Um, I was but most shy my high school class. I was also a little torn of my high school class. Despite doing well in those ways and not quite accomplishing my basketball dreams, I went on to get a good job, make good money. But I was still, in fact, more depressed and anxious and even suicidal uh, than ever. So at some point I decided I was going to do something about that. So I started doing some research on means and methods to kill yourself. And um, you know, I eventually decided I was going to slit my wrist. And uh, I had a strange experience there. You know, I had a kitchen knife and a steak knife and I dug into my wrist and really without anything changing in my external world. I mean, I had a pretty good you know, life at that point. I had a good paying job. I had a couple beautiful German cars, I had an incredibly beautiful and wonderful and intelligent girlfriend. And I had some friends and my family was healthy and I was healthy. And I didn't really have anything objective or external to complain about. And yet I subjectively on the inside was just miserable so anyway when i dug that knife into my wrist i felt the kind of peace and happiness that you dream about but that i had never really remembered feeling in that way so i decided to postpone the suicide for a while uh, i thought i could always you know take that action if necessary later and i started doing a different kind of research and a lot of that research is what led to the book happiness from the inside out I also wove in personal stories. And um, at that time, um, shortly after that, I had opened a private practice. And so I had some clients that I was learning a ton from and I was sharing a ton with. And so that's included in the book too. Now, Robert, you know, I've heard that, I've heard your story before and it's still, it saddens me tremendously to think that I'm, that it had to get to that point, that our lives on the outside you know, could look perfect. Like just before I, I had you on, I was sharing my story as well, that my life looked perfect from the outside. It checked off all the boxes that society, family, culture, religion tell you, you need to have a happy life. And why, why is it that we are feeling so empty and that there's a void inside of us that it doesn't matter what we try to do outside of ourselves. It just doesn't seem to fill it. And it's, that void that you felt inside was was a like not only just emptiness but darkness too. Yes. So, yeah, maybe you could speak to that a little bit in case there there's somebody listening that maybe is feeling that because I had you know that was my low point of my life too, um, but yours was a little bit darker. So maybe if you could talk you know a little bit like as I said to that in case there's somebody listening that's all could need to connect to that yeah um it was you're right it was uh dark and it felt lonely and it felt like this emptiness this vast emptiness that could never be filled or healed uh despite what i accomplished achieved or acquired which was strange it's not that i wouldn't get a little bump in my pleasure from good food or a decent vacation or an exciting moment in my life but it wouldn't last and it wouldn't provide nearly as much pleasure as I thought it would. And I also at the time kind of thought of pleasure and happiness as synonymous. They were the same things. Um, but I realized they are not the same thing at all. Um, there's a deeper, fuller, more lasting, meaningful, and abiding wholeness that exists not only within you, but as you, that we're often or occasionally unaware of. So the void and the emptiness that we often feel inside um, is real in a way, meaning that you certainly feel that there's something missing or lacking in your life. The 
one of the insights I think I discovered along the way was that that void, instead of spending time in the void and the emptiness long enough to see through it, I tried to fill it with stuff. And first and foremost, I tried to fill it with thoughts. Okay, I was trying to figure my way out of this misery that I felt every day, the pain and the suffering. And I tried to figure it out by, well, I need a new dream. I got to come up with a new, you know, instead of basketball, it'll be something else. And maybe it's the relationship and maybe I'll move to somewhere new and maybe I'll just make more money. Maybe it's the job. I got to find a new job, a new career. It's not that those things weren't all true on some level, on a relative level, for sure. You know, moving to somewhere sunnier helped. Getting a, you know, um, job that I enjoyed more helped. Um, not being in a relationship that the really wonderful person, um, but that made me miserable, like, like leaving that relationship helped. And ultimately, the void and the emptiness was still there. And what I eventually found was that that emptiness, that void is actually fullness. It's wholeness, it's holiness. But most of us run from it or we try to fill it up with things or people or places or activities or sensations, perceptions and thoughts and feelings. Um, so often, so frequently that we never come to discover that that divine emptiness is really everything you're looking for and searching for. That is so beautiful. The way you just said that, that is the truth. That is the truth. And that I discovered that with the void and the something missing for me was my true and authentic self, that I had been living my life according to external expectations, wearing many va many masks, that I say that I had many cloaks on and that the cloaks closed my eyes to who I really was. And that in order for us to discover the wholeness of who we really are, it does... Um, require us to remove those those layers of um for in this place cloaks that I had been put I had put on society had put on and that I now needed to reveal like in layers and that the universe very gently has given me situations where I've had to wake up to the cloak and then go ahead and heal and forgive and and let go of that so powerful i love that so that's exactly what it is right per personality persona mm -hmm. is a mask it literally means mask and if nothing else happiness and love and peace and wealth and success is an unmasking it's more like subtraction than it is addiction you know, we often think it's addiction i need to add something or someone to my life but it's an unmasking that happens and you begin to see it, and then you see through this illusion or this lie that tells you everything you're looking for is outside of you in the future, you know? And you come to realize and recognize that, wait, I experienced, for instance, me, this moment of peace, love, and happiness at what most people would call the bottom, the rock bottom point of my life. I'm taking a knife into my wrist. Now, how can I possibly feel better than I've ever felt when things seem to be going worse than they've ever gone? So that, recognition that where I was able to tease out or divorce or disconnect happiness from what was happening out there in the world and say, wait, I can feel whatever I want to feel despite what's happening around me, despite what I think should be happening around me. And I can take that into every experience new. Now that took me a while to really get to that place. Um, but it is an unmasking. It's an unveiling. It's um, like clouds in the sky. The sun is always there. It's always there. But we call it, it's a bad day. It's a rainy day. It's a cloudy day. Okay, true, relatively speaking. But if we look at it more deeply and more truly, we'll say, it's always, the sun is always shining. Always and forever. It's never not shined as far as we know, right? So it's more about seeing through the clouds or allowing the clouds to dissipate so that you can finally experience this, we'll call it the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. Right? Because ultimately the veiling, the masking that happens is really just a cloud of thoughts, the cloud of feelings and perceptions and sensations. And it doesn't ever truly blot out the sun. It doesn't blot out peace, love, and happiness at all. It just masks or veils your ability to see and therefore feel it in the way that you want to. Um, so, yeah. Now, uh, I'm so, like, I feel so grateful that in that moment that you did choose to, to stop 
you know, with the intention of, of her killing, hurting yourself. Can you talk to us about that moment when, like, what is it that inside of you, what happened in that instant where you just, you knew that you needed to stop? And which I'm so like eternally grateful that that you did. But please share that moment because that moment is really powerful too. For sure. It was the relief. I felt relief as I dug the knife into my wrist. And look, this has taken me probably 20 years to truly understand and process and integrate into my life. Because at that time, all I knew is that, wow, I feel pretty good. And yet nothing outside my life has changed. I also thought my brain was broken. There was something broken about me, clearly. I thought that even the best medication could never help me. So I never went down that path. You know, I could have, but I never did. I just knew or felt, knew, quote unquote, that there was something wrong and broken about me. When I dug this knife into my wrist and I realized I was feeling this other way, which was peaceful and happy and self-loving, I thought, well, that's odd. And at the time, I just decided I was going to put it off for five or 10 minutes, honestly, and said, I should just do a little research <laughs> in a different direction. Before I was looking at ways to kill myself, maybe I'm now I'll look up people and works that speak to what happiness is, where it's to be found. You know, I wasn't cl that clear about it. It sounds so clear now, but at the time I was just like, let me just look up some stuff about happiness. And then I discovered that first of all, oh my goodness, most people have been through at least one period, probably more, in their lives when they felt really, really sad. Now, clinical depression is different. It's more than that. It's different from that, but it's mostly that, okay? You're feeling deeply sad. You're not interested in things that you used to be interested in. You might not sleep well. You might sleep a whole lot. You might feel tons of anxiety. You might feel totally lethargic. But the idea is you feel deeply depressed. That recognition that I wasn't alone, that most people had felt something like I had felt, and that beyond that, lots and lots, millions of people have experienced clinical depression, lots and lots. In fact, famous people, popular people, rich people had experienced suicidal ideation and made suicide attempts. I was like, wow, there's something going on here. So that was the first piece, I'm not alone. Then the second piece was like, and lots of these people have recovered or found their way out of the darkness and the depths and the depression to the light again. They found peace and they found happiness. They found love. And a lot of them are talking about it. They're online like you are, Teresa, like sharing it. With the entire world, they've run, well, you know, written not just one book, but dozens of books, or they've done dozens of talks, and they give them away for free. So I thought, this is fascinating. If I'm, if I know anything, I'm not very smart, but I'm smart enough to know that I'm not very smart, and I can learn from smarter people, right? So I went down that path, and that's what it was like for me. Most days, it was two steps forward and a thousand steps back. That's what it felt like. Most days, for weeks and months, felt I still thought about and kind of wanted to commit suicide. Um, and then one day after keep do if I kept doing it because I didn't think or find or see any other options, uh, I woke up after a few days and thought, I haven't thought about suicide in a few days, you know? And isn't that interesting? And then before long, it was a couple of weeks and then before long, it was months. Yeah. Now, Robert, did in that, in that moment when you started to feel that peace, just envelop you. Do you attribute it to the Holy Spirit? Are you attributing it to God? Is it your higher self? Like who came to you in that in that moment where you halted? What is what was that for you? Yes. So the answer is yes. The Holy Spirit, the higher self, the inner self, life universe, infinite intelligence, whatever word we want to use, right? Because they're all synonymous or synonyms, um, for me at least. For the first time in my life, my mind was quiet, truly quiet. In contemplating the end of my life, I also contemplated the end of my problems, quote unquote, and the end of my pain. In that contemplation, or what I might even call the end of contemplation, there was perfect peace. There was perfect stillness and silence. And in that peace, stillness and silence was happiness. It was joy. Um, and so it sounds so almost laughable now that I worked so hard in my life to conjure up a feeling that I found simply by stopping thinking so much or at all. 
So that's taken me quite a while to kind of come around to it. The beginning, I just called it divine inter intervention, which is what it was also. <laughs> it's also that. Um, and, and the divine is intervening on our behalf all the time. We are the divine. Uh, we are divine. Each and every one of us and every moment is divine. You can't escape that no matter what it appears to look like, no matter how much it contradicts your intellectual or logical or rational thoughts about what it should look like. Um, every moment is infused with um, the divine. We're always standing on holy ground um, because we are holy. Um, and so, yes, for me, it was just an opportunity where the stillness and the silence and the quiet allowed the innate, inherent, infinite, eternal peace, love, and joy that is always within us and that is always us to finally bubble up in a way that it came to the surface and I could feel it, I could recognize it. It's like finally stepping out into the sun. I just had finally stepped out of my house. You know, I took off my blindfold. I unmasked myself and stepped into the sun and was like, oh, it feels so good. Yeah, so it was mostly that. And so with all of the things that you learned prior to um, that experience and then all the studying that you were doing afterwards, is that what then prompted you to want to write the book? Yeah, so I didn't have, I wasn't in full recognition of the power of presence alone uh, um, when I wrote the book. Um, and I love that about the book because if I had tried to start there, oh, <laughs> I had read all the books before. I'd read, you know, Eckhart Tolle. I had read Ramana Maharshi. I'd read these books before, but they didn't hit quite as hard as they do now. Then it was kind of like, oh, there's truth in this. I can see that. And, so for me, you know, happiness from the inside out is really about starting where it's easy, starting with a low hanging fruit. For me, one of the first things I did after this experience, after doing the research was I decided that if I know nothing else, everything that I'm doing with my life is leading me to depression and suicide. What if I just do the opposite? It's that simple. I'm just going to do the opposite, it's like opposite day. There was a Seinfeld episode like that. George decided to do the opposite and his life started going well and working for him so i did that i said i don't like this job i'm gonna find a way out of it i love this woman so much but i'm gonna find a way for us to go or separate you know amicably and happily um i don't love the cold weather i'm gonna go move somewhere warm i don't love the job i'm doing i'm gonna find something more interesting more purpose driven for me more passionate and i essentially did that i couldn't do it all overnight i did lots of it over the course of several weeks sometimes several months and that all got me into a place where then I could begin implementing some of the other stuff. But it was a kind of a hack job at first. You know, it was just kind of cobbling together stuff that I had read and felt and knew. And the big recognition at that time was like, you don't need to see the whole staircase, Rob, just the next step. And in fact, maybe you shouldn't or don't even deserve to see the whole staircase. Maybe it would get in your way if you saw the whole staircase, unless you take the next step. Just take the next step and then the one after that will light up. But if you don't act on the little bit that you know, you can't ask for more. So the one thing I knew was like, I'm going to move somewhere warm. It was like a big thing for me. Like I was like, but how am I going to figure out my career and how am I going to pay my bills? I have no idea. I had no idea. But I knew that if I continued doing what I was doing, I would land for sure back in suicidal ideation and probably a suicide attempt. So I just started with what I knew and happiness from the inside out is really about that. It's like really trying to express in the simplest, cleanest, clearest way and easiest way I can begin moving in or trending in a direction that feels happier and healthier. Yes. And so there were two nuggets that I want to pull out from what you just said. So happiness is also, also us allowing our joy to guide us towards our happiest life. And that I see happiness as a compass that if we are mindful of how we feel in, a, in any moment, that and we trust that feeling and we allow our mind to be a slave to the heart. So what I heard you say was, I knew that I loved the warmer weather. And so you were referring to feel how you felt about certain things in your life, how you felt about your job, how you felt about your relationship, how you felt about, you know, where you lived. And you said, how can I use my mind to figure out how I'm going to make this happen? 
And that is the key to us following our inner joy versus being guided, looking outside for that guidance and saying, you know, where can I find it? How do I search for it? Where do I look? All of that, where it's actually about tuning into how we feel feel and as i said using our our mind to be that slave and that's what you did and then the second nugget was that you said i didn't have to know what the whole staircase looked like i just had to know what the next step was and that's really another key and that there was a leap of faith that you took there that you said i don't know how this figure all of this out i just know that i need to follow this feeling of joy when I'm in these situations. And so I just, and ultimately, how did that, how did that turn out for you? Allow oh, yourself to have com- following happiness as a compass. So good. I just love the way you summarize that and reflect that back to you. So that's precisely it. I just let my feelings be my guide. Beautifully put. Um, it's easier to hear your heart when you quiet your mind. So it could be difficult for all of us, you know, it's like, what is my intuition saying? And is that just me following the path of pleasure or whatever? And it should be pleasurable. It should be pleasant. Um, But you nailed it. Absolutely. And, you know, it was looking back a risk and it does require a, a leap of faith. And also it didn't feel so much like a risk because it felt necessary. You know, it's like not a risk if it's necessary. I thought it's like, it's like basically do or die. I can do this or or die. And so it became a lot less, I guess, scary in a way um, at that time because I just thought, well, what's the worst that can happen? I'm going to be suicidal again? I already know where that's, <laughs> what that's like, right? So uh, yes, you nailed it there. And it, you're right, though. It requires a tremendous amount of, um, it requires some trust, just a little trust, a mustard seed level of trust, right? Uh, to know, and a huge part of it is knowing that it's good to feel good that it's good for you, it's good for all of us, it's good for the world that you feel good. That is something that I had to spend most of my life really turning around because we often are sold or buy a bad bill of goods that tells us no pain, no gain. If it feels bad, it must be good for you. If it feels good, it must be bad for you. It's like, no, 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 hold up. There is something so infinitely intelligent about the way in which we are all designed that when you feel good, it is an indication and it is proof and evidence that you're pointed in the right direction in some way. Now you might misinterpret it a little bit, you know, the heroin addiction is not necessary. Okay. That's, there are, there are other ways to feel a lasting, meaningful and abiding, really pleasurable and pleasant feeling and with a lot less side effects. Right. So we, over time, develop and deepen our discernment. That's what discernment is being able to see through that. Right. Um, but yes, you absolutely nailed it. It was, Trusting that just because it feels good doesn't mean it has to be bad. In fact, it can be good because it feels good. That's right. And now we came here to be happy. We didn't come here. There's this quote that says something like, you know, you come to you, you come to earth, you live, and then you die. Like that's just, and you're miserable and then you die. And it's like, no, that's not true. We didn't come here to be miserable. If the if the essence of who we are is love, peace, and happiness. That is who, and it's not that we're not going to have the opportunity to experience other emotions. We came here also on a soul level to have these experiences that would allow us to feel these other emotions other than just love and bliss. So we should feel into it when those situations happen. But ultimately, it's like, how do we get back into alignment with the truth of who we are, which is happiness? And so, you know, there was, you're probably familiar with it, there was a a study that was done where they offered people this, this situation where they said, if you if we could give you a happiness pill, where you would feel happiness, just like all the time, 24 seven, only happy, would you want to take it? And they said, and most of the participants said, no, they wouldn't, that we actually like the opportunity to fluctuate between like happiness and joy and peace and love and anger, frustration and sadness and all the other things that life brings. So it's not only about always feeling happy, but it is about returning to that part of ourselves that is infinitely, eternally, unwaveringly happy and abundantly happy. (laughs) 
Preach. I love that. Absolutely true. You're right about that. And gosh, I remember seeing that study. Love that study. And why do we go to the amusement park? Why do we want to be physically intimate and have sex with someone else? Why do we go to the movies? Right? We want to feel the entire range of emotions. And it's nice to be able to dial back in to the truth of who and what you are anytime, any place, at will, on demand. On demand, right? It's like sitting in the movie theater and you just remember, wait, I'm crying, I'm laughing, I'm turned on, I'm turned off, all within an hour or two. <laughs> and at any point in time, if I want, I can close my eyes, go inside, forget the movie that is life, the movie that is the world, the movie that is other people acting up or misbehaving or not giving you what you want. And I can feel perfect peace and love and happiness, call it God, call it life, call it source, on demand, at will, as you desire, when you desire, right? That's the beauty and power of it. That's why we go to the movies. Think about how crazy it is to go to the movies or to watch a TV show. It's actually crazy in some ways. And yet in the other, it's so beautiful. It's just a testament to precisely what you just said, which is with, that we love experiencing the entire range of human emotion and... You might, like me and some other folks, have a preference for peace, love, and happiness. And that doesn't mean that you can't also feel the rest of it. Also, the last thing I'll say is you also sometimes get to a place, and this is why, let's say, a roller coaster is so much fun. It's more fun if you're strapped in. <laughs> if you're not strapped in, okay, and you're like just swinging there, you know, in the wind as the roller coaster goes up and down and twists and turns, it's not fun anymore. It just feels terrifying. Finding God within spirit, recognizing your oneness with God within, with spirit, with life intelligence, with infinite intelligence, whatever you want to call it, just call it yourself. Feeling your connectedness, your eternal connectedness with yourself, the self, is like being strapped in. All of a sudden, it's like being in the movies and recognizing it's just a movie. And I can pretend and play and forget that it's just a movie and get drawn completely in and go crazy and cry and all that. But I also can live and watch that movie or ride this roller coaster, knowing that I'm perfectly safe and sound the entire time. There's nothing at risk. This is just a big virtual reality amusement park. Enjoy it as much as you can. Take it sincerely, but not seriously. And that's the challenge. It's like, you can enjoy it more deeply if you take it sincerely, but not seriously. If you take it too seriously, then you're screwed. You get lost in the world. You get lost in your own mind instead of being lost in God or spirit or source, which is essentially what you are. Thank you. And that just reminds me of, so I know you're also a student of the Course in Miracles, and that just reminds me of how, you know, we look at it as just that the whole, our whole human existence, just an illusion. So just as we go to the movies and that whole situation is an illusion, that reminding ourselves that the human experience that we live in every day is also an illusion and that it is really about always coming home to who we really are. And I loved when you said that we can do that at any moment, just by closing our eyes and connecting with our inner being instead of our outer being, that we are so outer and externally focused with our persona, with our personality, with our identity, with all the things that define us on the outside. But how much time do we make connecting with our inner being and that we can do that at any moment? And why I love that is that people think that, no, I got to go to like the yoga center. I have to go to the meditation center. I have to go to like a location <laughs> in order for you to like to connect with that. And it's, it's none of those things. It's not dependent on the candles and the incense and the outfit and the stone and the crystal <laughs> and the music. It's none of those things, Robert, that when you, and you said like earlier too, that it's so simple that in that moment of when you connected to your inner being, your holy, your, the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit in that moment, it was like when all of that is, is gone and closing your eyes and just centering on your breathing and going inward to say like it's like saying hello to you it's like oh, hello 
Hello. Yes. <laughs> Hello. And that part and that part of you is saying, you're amazing. You're incredible. <laughs> we love you. You're doing such a great job. You're just like you're magnificent. You're extraordinary. That's what happens when we go inward. It's like all the things that we're looking for outside of us, that validation, that status, that reverence, that that acceptance, that as soon as you go inward, your inner being is like. Oh my goodness. And then when you're there, you know, for me, what meditation is one of those ways, but I no longer need to only connect with that place with within me by doing meditation. Often it's just in complete silence. Now that when you practice it enough, because it is a practice that you can get to the point that you don't need any of that, which I think makes Eckhart Tolle's um, meditation work like a little bit challenging in the sense that it's just like silence. It's like, okay. For a beginner, I don't know about you, but for a beginner, that is hard. But I have worked my, my because I've been on my happiness journey for over 10 years now that I've worked to a point that I'm like you, that any moment you can just stop. Is it stop? Stop. Um, drop and roll. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that you remember. Oh, my gosh. Good memory. Yeah. Stop, drop and roll. That's right. Stop what you're doing. Right. Drop whatever it is you're worried about. Yeah. Yeah. Roll with nice. the moment. Roll yeah. With I love moment. that. It, I just love what you're saying here so much. I mean, and you see, I used to have so much trouble. I grew up Christian and I love, and I'm a lover of all religious and spiritual traditions. And I mean that quite literally, um, you know, I call myself more spiritual than religious. I think spirit, as we talked about, spiritual is um, the kernel and religion is the husk. And I feel strongly that um, God doesn't have a religion. He doesn't have a favorite religion or chosen religion. Uh, God has no religion and God appreciates, loves all religions, right? Um, and, and my experience growing up was so difficult because I was so at heart for the Bible. And so I tried to read the Bible, the Old Testament through, and I was poor, really tough. I just felt worse and worse as I read it with my little 13 year old brain, you know? And then I discovered later I was dating a, a woman and she was uh, Muslim. So I started reading the Quran. You know, I thought that was so interesting. Islam is so fascinating. It's so powerful. And then I, found the Tao Te Ching and I became interested in Taoism. And then, you know, you discover all these different religious and spiritual traditions. And I had so much trouble along the way because so much of them, so many of them spoke precisely about what you're speaking about, which is the stillness, the silence, the quietness, the, the sometimes, in some cases they call it meditation, sometimes they call it prayer, the holiest of holies, you know, the kingdom of heaven within. What's all this mean? And I remember seeing even scriptures like, you know, unless you're like one of these children, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean, right? The kids get it so much in so much greater way, instantly, immediately, um, than rather you know than adults do often, and that's because we have these phenomenally intelligent problem-solving devices we call a brain that are equally phenomenal as troublemakers. You know, it's a great problem problem solver, but also phenomenal troublemakers. In fact, almost better troublemakers than they are problem solvers because the brain's job is to find problems to solve, to justify its position. It's like the century of a ship, it's its job. So it would, if and when it can ever find a problem, it will create one just for the purposes of solving it. And that's the very thing that we love that can keep us alive. It's also the very thing that keeps us from thriving and keeps us from experiencing the inherent and innate peace, love, and happiness that exist always within us. And when you're able, at the beginning, it's hard to just say, I'm not going to think. I'm just going to go into the quiet, like you said. You know, mm -hmm. That's why I wrote Happiness from the Inside Out from a different place, really. One is because I wasn't there yet. And second, because you know, uh, it's just way too difficult. It's high-hanging fruit. I just couldn't even barely recognize. I knew it was important. And I put in parts of it, I put it in the book. But it's important to start where it's easy, right? And for me... And we all have something like this, something that puts you in flow state. For me, it was running sports. When I'm running, I hate it so much that at some point, <laughs> I hate it so much that at some point, my mind just goes quiet and you enter a little runner's high. And then you get these little downloads, these little insights about life and about yourself. And before long, you discover that you can have that same or experience that same flow state when you're not running, when you're in the shower, when you're eating. And then you discover, oh, wait, I don't need to do anything with my body at all. You just sit here and fill in to the peaceful aliveness or the alive peacefulness in my body, the anim animating force or life energy in my body. Now that vibrating energy that's in your hands and your feet, 
that is your true self, the self that is God or life or spirit. And just feeling into it without thinking about it, you don't need to have any color commentary about it. You can if you want, but just feeling into it for its own sake, for joy's sake, for peace's sake, for love's sake alone. And you discover that just by doing that, it's like a dimmer switch. It just turns up the light that you are, the peace of love and happiness that you are. And then you see it reflected in the world around you, in your circumstances and conditions, in your finances and your health and the beauty of your body and all ways and all places, right? But again, the encouragement, at least from me, I mean, I think it's from you too, is to start where it's easy. You don't have to start at the Eckhart Tolle level. You can start with running, with art, whatever, whatever it is that you feel called to do. Yes, yes. And that was part of the message that Spirit gave to me about happiness, that I was also living the human experience and looking outside myself for, for all of the things that we attribute happiness to be found. And I was like, then the pandemic, but even prior, I'd already been, but during the pandemic, I had some more conversations. So I'm a Reiki master and channeler as well, where I said, well, now look, everything's closed down. How do you expect me to be happy when I try to go to the mall? <laughs> totally. Totally. Oh, it's right. you, you can't go to restaurants or you can't hang out with friends. Or And that was lots of people's comments, right? It's like, how do you expect us to be happy when we can't do a lot of the things that we attribute our happiness to? And so when I asked Spirit that, it said to me that these things, which I now call part of our happiness toolkit, are all vehicles that help us to connect with the place inside of us that is always happy. So if you think, well, I'm happy when I go to the um, sporting event or to the concert or to the patio or to the networking or the parties or wherever you think your happiness is found, is that all that's really happening is that those are a vehicle that helps you to connect to the happiness, as you also said, that we can connect to at any time, at any moment that we experience as that flow state because it just feels so good. And time is like, you don't even pay attention to it. There's It's effortless, tons of energy, all those good feelings. But really what's happening is that we're in the present moment, right? And so when we're there and we're completely appreciating what that present moment is offering us is that we're connected. That's what we are. We are connected to that inner being, to that love, peace, and happiness. Our original nature, our, our essential self is always that. So you're connected. So I want people to know that it's not the things. It's not the environment. It's not the people. It's not the vehicle that's helping you to get there because the vehicles can change, as we know, right? The circumstances outside of ourselves that we cannot control are constantly in flux, constantly changing. So how do we always remain in our happiness bubble that that's how I was during COVID? I'm in my happiness bubble and wherever I go, it, it's with me. I'm in my bubble. And so I was very happy sitting on my boring back porch, <laughs> looking at my backyard and being very excited about all the animals that were just doing their thing and and seeing the colors and the vibrancy of, of nature that I that I didn't even see before really like really stopping and smelling the roses to a whole different degree that everything is magical everything is sparkling it's lit like it's it's like that it's magical and it's sparkling and I don't know if you experience like life like this too, that as you said, as we continue to move more and more into that connection with our truth, that it just changes how we live every day. Absolutely. Um, it's got to be practical, right? So, and it is practical. In fact, it's the most practical thing. <laughs> Everything else is only pseudo practical. It works for a little while and then it doesn't. This is something that works always and forever um, because it is what you are always and forever. I love what you called these like joy vehicles. I call them, it's maybe it's called joy riding. I used to call them happiness islands, but it really is maybe a better word. It's like joy vehicles or joy riding, which is like these activities or people or places or things that allow you to feel that happiness and that peace and that flow state more, most easily and effortlessly and enjoyably. Critical to identify those. The real recognition there, of course, is a couple. One is recognizing that 
those are channels and not sources. They're the channels and not the source. Yes. Okay? Always and forever, anything you feel comes through you, it comes through your consciousness, your awareness. And so you, you can also call it God, call it spirit, but is source always. So wherever you go, you take yourself with you. I promise you, wherever you go, you take that peace and love and happiness with you, even in the worst of places. Um, my God, and that's why in the Bible says something like, and I will always be with you kind of thing, you know, what, no matter where you go kind of thing. So the idea is that first and foremost, um, to, and we want to feel grateful for the channels. It's nice, but you don't want to become so attached to the channels that you forget it's the source mm -hmm. that deserves your true appreciation and gratitude. It's like acknowledging yourself, the self God in all its ways. Right. And so, yes. And like you said, over time, you discover as you put more and more of the focus and attention on the source itself, you can turn it off or on at will, right? There's another piece here too, which is that for lots of us, you know, like all those things in the world, the new car, the new partner, the kids or the family, or maybe the divorce, whatever it is you're looking forward to and hoping will be an opportunity for happiness in the future is often an obstacle to being happiness, happy now. It becomes an, an obstacle, right? Because you're like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this thing and then be happy. So you're kind of committed to unhappiness, you know, until this desire is realized or until this dream is fulfilled. It's part of the challenge with this future-oriented mindset. And then we get into the future, we just say, hey, when I get there, I'll stop, slow down and smell the roses. I'll finally be happy. But no, you take that future-oriented mindset with you into the future and then you project it into the next moment, the next year, the next decade. And that's kind of the part of the problem with um, sort of a destination addiction that we often develop around this idea or concept of happiness. And so to your point, happiness is in the present. I'd say it's presence itself. That presence already has everything and everybody that you're seeking on the outside. It's already there. It doesn't feel like it. And at the very beginning, and I want to hear your experience around this, Teresa. In the beginning, it's like stepping into that dark room, any dark room. At first, you're convinced there's nothing there. It's, this room is empty. It's so dark. So why would I be in here? I could be out there in the light. Sure, the light doesn't have what I want. I've been searching my whole life for this feeling of peace or love or happiness, or I can't find my partner anywhere. Why should I spend time in meditation or prayer or doing things that allow me to feel more flow state? It feels so dark in there, right? But if you spend enough time in there, if you just sit it out a little, you know, come back to it, return to it over and over again, before you realize it, your eyes begin to adjust. And this seemingly empty room, you realize is full it's full of stuff there are furniture and there's there's furniture and there's couches there's gold coins there's money there's other people in there all this stuff but you don't realize it if every time you enter in you quickly run out the door again you never realize that the true treasure you're looking for is inside and that once you sort of discover the peace and love and the happiness that's inside that doesn't feel or seem like much at first once you realize that and stick with it long enough and do it for joy's sake alone you begin to see it appear outside of you in the world as well. It really does without you having to do all this hard work around it and struggle and strain yourself in the way that you're accustomed to. With just doing this one thing going in, you find that when you get that inside right, the outside does you know, tend to fall in place. It's like all of the events of our life are leading us up to that moment where we stay in that room just long enough to actually discover the treasure oh, that's inside of us. That that's right. All along that we've been searching for those treasures outside. But meanwhile, they exist and always had existed inside of us. And if we just stay there long enough, it was like that moment when I, for, I meditated for the very first time. And I went in saying, I have a stack of books on my nightstand. I want to hear from God. How come these people can see? How come these people can hear? And I, my entire life, I've been, I've been praying to God and I want, I want to hear. And so um, spirit said to me through a medium that you need to meditate. And when the moment, and I didn't know what that was, I was like, I don't know what that is. And so luckily I went to a meditation center close by my home. They said, we will help you to get started and it will help you figure out what this is and how to do it. And it, it was like, literally like spirit was like, like that, like that um, choir moment. Yes. Of like, we have been trying to talk to you like your entire life and you just didn't quiet yourself enough to listen. 
And they will tell you that I cried for an entire year every time I went because I was like, oh my God, that my whole life had led me to that moment of discovering that light, as you said, that, and it was there that I discovered the unconditional love that I had been searching for outside myself in all the wrong places. And so that if we could now I'm thinking, I know you're, I can see you nodding and I'm like, but how do I like now segue into your second book? And I know we're right running out of time too, but how can we maybe bridge the gap between both of those two books? And just before you answer that, I want to say that Wayne Dyer, you know, one of my also spiritual mentors that who wrote tons and tons of books, that one of his latest books, which is I can see clearly now is this him looking back at his entire life and how the universe very slowly brought him along to like where he was at the end. And that his, you know, his, the, his very first book, The Erogenous Zones, that, you know, bestseller, international, whatever, was him very much stuck in, in the psychology of him, you know, being in a professor and all of that. And that all the events of his life slowly began to reveal to him more and more in who he really was. And that you know, my book too, uh, which is called the steps to happiness that I can only uh, release once my PhD is complete, um, is exactly the same spirit had me write it in 2016. And then five years later, when um, I was ready to start to put it out, but then the PhD opportunity came, so I could, I didn't. And I said to spirit, like, why did you have me write the book when I did? And it was because Teresa, the person you were five years ago is not the person you are today. And that the nuggets that I managed to, um, to record, let's say, that summer, as I had this huge download, that that was the book at that time, that's going to connect with a lot of people that were there that are there at that point. And so I don't know, I know, and am I only saying this because when you're referring to that first book that you're like, well, that was like my understanding of like, of what happiness was like and everything, but things have evolved since then. And I know you also shared with me just personally that you've written other books too, that I'm sure are going to be released and that are chronicling this evolution of knowledge around what love and happiness really is. Absolutely. Gosh, so much so many gems there. <laughs> so many gems, really. The first part I'll say is, um, you're right. Foresight seems blind. Hindsight is always 2020. <laughs> and you want to keep that in mind as you're living your life. You can only sort of connect the dots looking back often. And that's actually beautiful. It allows life to remain a mystery. And if you allow life to remain a mystery and you live it like a mystery, it's pure bliss. But if you deny the mystery or try to, you know, you live like life like a problem to be solved instead of a mystery, then it's misery. It's just misery, right? And so it's an important part to remember that um, even if you can't see how the dots connect, I promise you they connect. Mm. This, the second piece is if I were to describe an executive, executive summary format, both books, I'd say happiness from the inside out essentially is about unconditional happiness how to be happy no matter what. The research there all points to the fact that success doesn't lead to happiness. Decades of research proves that. But happiness does lead to success. So success doesn't lead to happiness, but happiness does lead to success. And happiness is the greatest success. You get happiness, everything else is added. Love goes beyond that, but also repeats that in a way. Love, for me, is just your happiness shared. It's your self-love shared. That's the heart of happiness from the inside out. Mm -hmm. When you get happy and you share it, we call it love. When you are happy, but you stay at home and you're just hanging out by yourself, it's called happiness, right? But it's really one energy perceived in two different ways. It's one coin, but two sides of that single coin. So at the end of the day, lots and lots and lots of words are written and spoken and shared about peace and love and happiness and God. And they're all extraordinarily valuable pointers. But the invitation for all of us, and certainly for me, is to spend more time applying or spend time applying what I know, what we know, 
already, whether it's from Teresa's book, whether it's from my books, whether it's from anybody else's book, out, Abraham Hicks, Eckhart Tolle, Rupert Spira, Ramana Maharshi, oh my gosh, of course, in Miracles, so many phenomenal authors and teachers out there, all with incredibly, well, infinite wisdom to share. Um, but yeah, it's like knowing is doing. And if you don't do, you don't really know. So you want to you want to apply as much as possible. And I think it was Bruce Lee that said this, and I love this so much. He said, I, I fear not the person who has practiced a thousand kicks once, but the person who has practiced one kick a thousand times. So we don't have to know a whole lot. In fact, often it's the knowledge that gets in the way of you experiencing and enjoying the inherent and innate peace, love, and happiness that you ultimately are. Ah, oh, take my breath away there, Robert. Thank you so much. And I just feel like it's such a, a beautiful uh, winding down to our conversation today. Now, if I'm going to ask you to leave our listeners with a piece of, I don't want to say a piece of knowledge, but I'm going to say more of a piece of yourself, because our self is all of that, our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual self all bundled in together. So a piece of you with our listeners that you would like them to take away from our conversations today um, to go forward. So yeah. you know, maybe what, what nugget could you leave them for today just to, to either sum it up or something for them to think about or the most important part of our discussion today that and I, I feel like I've heard you articulate it in you know many of the different ways that I'm going to ask you, you know how can people connect with you after the show which you definitely need to check out Robert's uh, social media because he talks about this uh, incredibly on all of those and just so eloquently and just for me just so bang on and and correct and true and so if you can share that in just a moment as well um but what would you like people to take away you are so wonderful teresa i just want to keep you i think we all want to keep you forever truly <laughs> um thank you so much thank you. I think less live more think less be more um and but i mean spend more time being less time thinking think less enjoy more just think less, enjoy more, think less, feel more. And what you really want to feel is feel into your own presence. Your presence is God's presence. It's the presence of everything and everyone you truly want. I promise it's the essence of that. The most important part of that is the cake. And if you do that often enough, meaning feeling into your own alive presence, not what you are, but that you are, it doesn't matter what you are, just that you are just recognizing I'm alive, Feeling into the aliveness in your own body, just that. You can call it God. Feeling into the presence of God for its own sake. No matter what you're doing. Going for a walk, having lunch, dozing off to sleep, listening to someone else, speaking to someone else. Just allow for more and more touch points with the presence of God or the presence of spirit, the presence of happiness and love that exists within you for its own sake. And I promise you that your whole life will change. Your whole life will change without doing anything else, without being anything else, without asking for anything, without begging for anything, without visualizing a whole lot or smudging or doing any of these things, retreats everywhere. You can do those things too, for sure. But just by practicing the presence of yourself, the self, God, your whole life will change. So I guess that's my encouragement. Thank you. We need to be more human beings rather than human doings, just human beings. Yeah. And being mindful in every moment and how this gift of life is really a gift that we call it the present. I know it sounds cliche, but it really is a gift. And how many times do we stop and appreciate all day long the gift of what it means to be alive, to stop and, and look at all the miracles and to really tap into heaven on earth it's it, it's here just many of us are not tapping into it that that when you do and you and you do exactly as robert said that it changes your life because heaven is revealed to you as you as more of yourself is revealed to you through these practices that we that we've spoken about 
Oh, that's so good, Teresa. I just want to add, yes, it's so powerful. I just want to say yes, yes, and yes to all of that. Um, and um, that, that heaven, that home that you just spoke of is something that we wake up to, right? So there's no needing to go to it or get to it or even touch into it. These are just concessions. This is a concession to language. We have to speak about it in some way. But it's where we always live. You're always living in the lap of God or spirit. You're always in heaven. You're always at home. You don't recognize, you don't realize it because like all of us, you've fallen asleep sometimes and you've started dreaming and you're having a nightmare that any number of things is happening. Okay. But as they say so beautifully in the course of miracles, that which is real can't be threatened. That which is unreal doesn't exist. Uh, so meaning that behind between, above, below, beneath. Every single thought, feeling, sensation, perception, condition, and circumstance of your life is perfect harmony, perfect happiness, perfect, perfect love, and perfect peace. You're always existing in and as that. And so it's just coming, becoming more and more aware that where you want to be is where you always are and what you want to be is what you always are. It's just that. It's just an awakening. So please don't think it's a whole lot of hard work. I promise you it's not. I took the hard, long path, yes, but you don't have to. That's why Teresa and I and everybody else out in the world writes books and shares things so you don't have to take the long, indirect, scenic route to it. You can go directly to the source for it. Amen. Amen. And and I, it, it sounded so much like this beautiful affirmation as well as this just beautiful prayer too. So amen. And, and as it is exactly as you said. So thank you, Robert, please share with us how people can get and find out more about you, get in touch with you, hear more about your work. Sure. Um, you can find me at my website at coachrobmack.com. You can find me on most social media platforms, probably most consistently Instagram at Rob Mac M A C K official. And you can find both these two books and then the nine I'm going to release hopefully soon. We'll see um, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and pretty much anywhere and everywhere else great books are sold. Wonderful. I want to thank you so, so, so much for being with me here today to kick off the happy hour with Teresa Greco on, on hopeful radio. You were the perfect, the perfect guest and everything that you shared, it was just so powerful and so enlightening. And when I say enlightening, it's because the light that you are is just, is just emanating through every word that you said and, and just every inch of your being for those that are watching this, you know, over YouTube. Um, it was just incredible. Thank you so much for being with us. I love and appreciate you so much, Teresa. You don't know. And it takes light to recognize light. So that is a compliment as much to you as it ever is to me. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to leave you with the thought for the day. The mission of the happy hour is to help you connect with true happiness that resides inside yourself and is not external to you. Yes, you might feel temporary pleasure when you get that promotion at work, you find that new love relationship, you go on that vacation, you get that designer purse, but you'll, re you'll realize that once that feeling of pleasure wears off, you're left feeling unhappy and looking for that next thing to make you happy again. That's because those examples are talking about pleasure and not happiness or joy. True inner happiness is unwavering and is always there for you to tap into, even when your external circumstances may not necessarily be the way you want them to be. You can always tap into the happiness within yourself so that you can be truly happy. I invite you to check out my services on my website at teresagreco.ca for more information about my coaching, workshops, and motivational speaking opportunities. You can connect with me on my Instagram page at teresagreco underscore steps to happiness, as well as my Facebook page, Steps to True Happiness with Teresa Greco. Thank you again for joining me on the first episode of the Happy Hour with Teresa Greco. Keep smiling and be happy.